She waited in the Dragon's Keep, in the highest room of the tallest tower, for her true love and true love's first kiss. <laughs> yeah. Like that's ever gonna happen. What a lot of Famous myths haunt our culture and inevitably our art. Though I often act like it, I'm not under the delusion that works of fiction alone are responsible for shaping every facet of how we view reality, but to deny that art, which is both a reflection and a part of our culture, affects popular thought would be naive. I want to unpack some of these myths, one of which is a theme which I've touched upon before, a couple of times actually. The idea of the perfect girl. I made a throwaway line in my Barbie video about how horrible the love interest trope is as a default of fiction. This is the video where I expand upon that, more specifically, female love interests in male-oriented stories. Not that other love interests don't also have things on pack, but as a guy who was raised with these stories, which cause what I now see to be a screwed up version of how love works and by proxy gender dynamics, I have special opinions about this. So I want to go through a few of these stories I grew up with and their different takes on romance, investigating what potential truths and lies they reveal. Whether any of this actually happened or not is not the focus, so don't go start in in the comments. But Adam and Eve narratively sets the stage for everything. From the very beginning, the woman enters the story because God looks at the man and sees he is lonely. God rips out a literal part of Adam's body to create Eve, a little friend for Adam. She's like a man, but bumpier. Literally made in service of the man to quell his loneliness. Then she gets manipulated by that terrible serpent, convincing Adam to follow suit. The trick with this story is that Adam and Eve both committed the same sin of breaking the one rule that God gave them, but the blame usually falls on Eve. Not only did she sin first, but she was manipulated, then tempting Adam. You know, Adam ate the fruit because of the one he loves, while Eve ate it because a random talking snake told her to do it. What are you? An idiot sandwich. A couple very unfortunate tropes were born out of this incident. Contradictory, but very common tropes which still exist today that of the temptress and the innocent maiden, both of which are embodied in this first woman. However, come to think of it, I don't know if the Bible ever really said that Adam loved her. Though, I mean, I guess he didn't have a choice. Mary Magdalene is another figure I've covered a bit here, arguably one of the most interesting female love interests because she isn't one at all, at least not in the canon. Mary's whole existence in the evolution of the ethereal woman mythology is interesting because most people's understanding of her does not come from the text at all, but rather people's projections and impressions of the text, most of this evolution taking place through painting, the same paintings that made Jesus a Jewish man into a European supermodel. Sometimes American. Mary's been taken from a female disciple, only mentioned briefly, to a prostitute and forbidden love interest of Jesus himself. Some believe that Jesus wanted to get with her, but knew he mustn't because of his Christly duties. Others believe it was Mary who wanted him. They're both wrong, but I do find it interesting how perhaps the fact that most of these painters and storytellers have been men has so thoroughly distorted the narrative of a story treated with such reverence. I guess it could be said that romance has always existed in some way, even before the romantic period made it a thing. The whole idea of people falling in love and becoming automatically romantically attracted to each other is a very modern invention. In fact, what we now call romantic love was once seen as a mental illness. 
Romeo and Juliet, which is now largely seen as this beautiful story of love conquering all by many, could just as easily be seen as a tragedy of these two confused, hopeless kids. This boy and girl from enemy states who become lovesick fools, eventually unaliving themselves over a misunderstanding. This is silly Billy behavior, but that very tragedy, the absurdity of their pairing has since become a part of the beauty of this story. I'm not saying I'm against romance, I spend hours each day, every day, drawing and writing essays that make no money, I'm as romantic as it gets, but we need to remember in the end, we are all being quite silly. Give me your hand. <laughs> Why? I want to see if our energies converge. Blimey's World is an interesting one because this is a rare case of a romantic pairing in fiction that I actually think is cute and wonderful and it's for all of the reasons why Romeo and Juliet is quite silly. While it may seem that the Cory and Topanga love story is a fairy tale romance of a boy and a girl who fall in love at first glance and live happily ever after, when you actually return to this coming of age story you realize just how much effort these two had to put in to make this work. Even the plot itself regularly retcons their origin story to make the romance work. You told me that we used to take walks in our strollers together around the block. When we were two, we were best friends. I mean, I, I knew everything about this girl. I knew her favorite color. I knew her favorite food. The way that the characters are introduced, Topanga is a nerdy little weird girl who Cory, our protagonist, is reluctantly paired up with on a school assignment. Cory is going through his own struggles, particularly regarding his hair and how he's perceived. I'd rather have the earth crying than my friends laughing. <laughs> People make fun of you, Topanga. So? I just want to blend in. Well, you're sure good at it. You look like all the other plain wrapped kids at school. And their first kiss is actually one that Topanga steals from him when he's feeling all self-conscious about his appearance. Because it would be interesting if all your life you remembered that your first kiss happened when you thought you looked weird. I got that on cat night. I had to wait an hour in line. Well, if it's important to you, then it's beautiful. Over the course of the story, we watch as these two get older, go through struggles and develop their love. But it is tried and tested over and over again. One of the most iconic scenes in the series is in one of the most devastating episodes, when Topanga's family moves out of town, leaving Cory a heartbroken mess. Mom, I don't want to know other girls, okay? Yeah, I don't think that's healthy. Topanga and I would have been together for the rest of our lives. No, you wouldn't have been. This is when we hear a knock on the door. Like a fool, so if life doesn't want me and Topanga together, then you can't fight life, can you? Sorry. This is objectively stupid behavior, but it's so sweet. Their relationship throughout the run of the series continues to undergo challenges and tests, but they make it work. Spoilers for this 30 year old sitcom you should have watched already, but they get married. The show had a spin off about their kids. Though one does wonder about the couples who tried and tried, but in the end were hurt by this story. Sunrise, a song of two humans, follows a farmer who is convinced to drown his wife by his city girl mistress who wants to run away with him. He'd been neglecting this poor, sweet country wife anyway, so it didn't take all that much convincing. He takes his wife out to the sea under the pretense of a little boat ride. gets up, advances towards her, and she realizes what is about to happen. She stares at him in horror, unable to recognize the man in front of her. Those eyes pierce his very soul, he can't do it. They arrive on land, and she runs away from him, but he chases. He regrets everything, she is horrified, but then, the bulk of the second half of the film watches the two fall back in love. It is wonderful. 
literally makes me cry every time I watch it. A, a true testament to the power of love, or at least the power of cinema. That they can, in one scene, depict a man on the brink of murder, then manipulate the audience into buying that they can completely recover and become closer than ever, all within the course of one day. If the story was taken from the perspective of the wife, it wouldn't be a romance. It'd be horror. I cannot stress this enough, ladies. If your man tries to murder you, leave. Run. Run. Fire. Do not try to make it work. Through the power of love, you cannot fix him. But because this story is centered around the man, it is a tale of temptation, redemption, and the power of love. The two women are hardly people at all. They are concepts made to support his journey again. I love this film so much and highly recommend it. But you have to look at these things for what they are. Charlie Chaplin and a lot of the silent comedian stuff usually boil down to the protagonist doing whatever they were doing to impress a girl. City Lights, another film which I love, which makes me cry every time I watch it, has Chaplin's tramp character, a homeless man, meet a blind girl and try to help her out by giving her money he gets through some shenanigans he's been getting up to with a depressed tycoon. Lots of commentary about social class and this stuff, and let me just say again, I do recommend this film, it's wonderful. But at the very end of the film, the girl has gotten enough money to get an operation to get her eyesight back, and the tramp, through a truly heartbreaking set of circumstances, is more down on his luck than ever. He finds a girl... Sees that she's gotten her eyesight, she sees him. She's never seen him before, so he's just another beggar in her eyes. But she soon realizes she can feel it. It's him. Who saved her? This is the scene that destroys me every time. They end up together. He has earned, perhaps, bought her affection. Of course, it's the trope that's prevalent throughout male and female dominated fiction. The damsel in distress may be the most common trope that worms romance into non romantic stories, whether it be the old fairy tales, these silent films, superhero stuff. Lots of guys grow up being fed this narrative that women are indebted to you, that their affection is something that can be earned. We're bots. Yeah. Hell, what else am I going to do with my money? I wish you'd have listened to this. Maybe Why if they I? like you in that way, but no one owes you anything. This is something that makes a lot of guys lash out when they realize that women have their own, you know, minds and ambitions. Wait a second, wait a second. You have to go. You have to go. Can I talk to you at least? I mean, will you at least talk to me? I didn't know you. Look, won't you take the record? I've already got it. Whether it be Travis Bickle becoming a homicidal maniac when he realizes his love interest isn't into his vinyls or his porno movies. Hey, let's not have any trouble. Okay. You to me about, why won't you talk to me? Come on. Why won't you talk to me? Why don't you answer my calls when I call? You think I don't know you're here? Let's not have any you trouble. Think I don't know. Or Hal becoming a literal supervillain when he realizes his love interest will not automatically like him when he gets superpowers. Mega Mind finds his self worth when he realizes that he does not have to be what society deems him to be. A supervillain. <laughs> Mega Mind. Oh, bravo, Metro Man. <laughs> Roxanne, the reporter who everyone believed was dating Metro Man, the big muscled superhero. Roxanne, don't panic, Roxy. I'm on my way. Yeah, I'm not panicking. Eventually falls for our blue boy when he hangs out with her casually, finding out they have a lot in common. I never knew you were so funny. And I never heard you laugh before. Granted, for kids' movie tension, he is in disguise. But under this disguise, ironically, he stops pretending and finds that they make a nice pair. 
I'm having a party at my house. It's gonna be like off the hook or whatever. Oh, I, I don't know how. I don't really feel like being around a bunch of people. No, no, no. That's the best part. It'll just be like you and me. Wow. Then you have Roxanne's widowed her assistant, Hal. Chicks don't like bounty houses. They like clowns. Who believes Ow. that she only likes chads like Metro Man? Don't panic, Roxy. I'm on my way. Yeah, I'm not panicking. So when he is gifted powers, he tries to win her over by tossing her around and saving her. You almost died, but I saved you. This does not work. This is great. Now there's nothing keeping us apart. No, it's not great. Wow. Look, there is no us, okay? There will never be an us. But I have powers. I have a cape. I'm the good guy. You are a good guy, Hal. But you don't understand. We need to find no. out why, this, this, Hal. This Just isn't right. Breath and listen You're to me supposed to be with me. I'm trying to warn you, Hal. It's Titan. It's Titan, not Hal. I dream of Genie is a delightful sitcom that I can't recommend to anyone because it's violently sexist. Tony Nelson is a Floridian astronaut who finds a genie in a bottle, washed up on a beach. It didn't act like a bottle. Because in it was a genie. Oh, not your average everyday genie, but a beautiful genie who could grant any wish. She turns out to be a gorgeous woman who becomes immediately indebted to and infatuated with our protagonist, walking behind him and calling him master, granting his every wish. It is as clear as day, the ultimate patriarchal male fantasy of having a gorgeous woman drop in your lap and immediately become subservient and infatuated with you. Oh, do you enjoy the cold weather? Yeah, yeah. I must say, some of the happiest days of my life were spent in the snow and the, the cold in Wisconsin. Like that, Master? <laughs> Hey, that's wonderful, Gene. That's what Dr. Bellows, yeah. <laughs> oh, sir? Major Nelson. I don't know quite how to tell you this, but it's snowing on your house. Oh, yes, I see. I, well, it's probably one of those freak summer storms we had. The show almost addresses the allegations of sexism with one episode centered around the women's liberation, which was in full swing at this time. Jeannie gets involved, introduced the idea that she should not be serving this man after all. What have you been doing? I've been doing nothing. <laughs> yeah, well, I know that, but I mean, what have you been doing? I have been studying the emancipation of modern woman. I guess you got so caught up in it, you forgot to do the housework, huh? Oh, I did not forget. I decided to let you do it. <laughs> but the episode concludes with the sentiment that that's different because Jeannie isn't a woman. Now, this yeah, but that advice is for ordinary women. Now, you're not ordinary women. You're a genie, genie. Nice save. The trope of the naive, dare I say, infantile female character who serves the male protagonist is a trope that was before and continues to be prevalent in male fiction, though it would interestingly be challenged by another comedy series from the other side of the globe. Urusei Yatsura is a manga by Rumiko Takahashi, a woman, also known for Ranma Half and Inuyasha, among other series. And the first half of the anime series is directed by Mamoru Oshii, also known for Ghost in the Shell, Angel's Egg, and Pat Labor. This is a good show, but it started a legacy of trash. An age old dilemma. Urusei Yatsura follows a young cat caller pervert Ataru who after a misunderstanding, becomes married to a hot space princess, Lum. Lum is in many ways the exact ethereal, naive, magical girl that we've been discussing with Genie, but there's a twist. Ataru doesn't want her.
Sure, Tony from Genie doesn't want his Genie either, but he's presented as this stoic gentleman who's a little annoyed when Genie makes mistakes. You did not eat your breakfast, master. Oh, no, I didn't have time, Genie. Oh. Though he clearly does like her. But Atta is this teenage creepy sleaze ball pervert. All the girls hate him. <laughs> the guys envy him. <laughs> and his parents openly express regret over having had him. Takahashi does not want us to like him. She wants us to like Lum. Lum loves Ataru so unconditionally, it makes you feel bad for her. Lum is the perfect girl in the sense that she loves him to this truly absurd extent despite him having almost no redeemable qualities. And yet he still makes her feel like garbage by going around flirting with every single woman he comes across. The story seems to have this message that men don't really love women, but they like the idea of the pursuit. Ataru literally has a woman carefully manufactured to be the ultimate male fantasy and infatuated with him, but he'll still run around and chase skirts. The joke in this case is firmly on him. Though if you know anything about anime, especially contemporary anime, you'll know that the nuance of this story is almost completely discarded by its contemporaries in favor of complete fantasy. The ecchi harem genre is arguably one of the most uh, aggressively problematic genres ever, giving its demographic of teenage boys and many full-grown men a fantasy to indulge in where various hot women are into you despite you having no favorable qualities whatsoever. <laughs> It perpetuates the myth of men being entitled to female affection, even if he does nothing, is openly repulsive, and or straight up hates women. These protagonists have a real way of just hating women. Anime people, leave me alone. Even in my weebiest of weeb days, this genre has always put me off. Like, am I the only one who thought even then that the meme that few years ago where we were just literally making inanimate objects into anime girls was strange? Like seriously? And it just sucks because the show that's usually cited as starting the genre had such nuance. Capitalism. Why does everything have to be so complicated? If you want something bad, you have to fight for it. Step up your game, Scott. Break out the L word. Lesbian? The other L word. Lesbians? Scott Pilgrim is often cited as an incel fantasy. Ramona Flowers is Scott's literal dream girl, introduced to the story by skating across his mind, appearing in his dreams. Literally. Scott, who is a 23-year-old dating a barely 17-year-old teenager, Amazing. She seems nice. Yeah. Yeah, she seems awesome. Yeah. Scott, if your life had a face, I would punch it. Yeah. Wait, what? Drops everything and seeks her out, now having to do battle with her seven evil exes. The story is something else. Ramona Flowers is the poster child of the manic pixie dream girl, appearing to Scott at this truly harrowing state in his life, coming off of an earth-shattering breakup, prompting him to take advantage of this literal child, and Ramona, in his eyes, has come to save him from himself. Scott Pilgrim's a difficult one because obviously Scott's a garbage person, but the story deliberately frames him as an everyman. Garlic bread is my favorite food. I could honestly eat it for every meal, or just eat it all the time without even stopping. <laughs> you get fat. No, why would I get fat? Bread makes you fat. Bread makes you fat? He's just a little guy doing his best. He has no idea how he's hurting the people around him or just 
how scummy he truly is. And Ramona is framed as this angelic, ethereal being to come to save him. However, as the story goes along, we learn that Ramona is just as flawed. Ramona has hurt many people in her past and continues to put on an emotional front to shield her from being hurt or hurting others. This is something I think the comic does way better than the film, but as the story goes, we are introduced to both of these characters' flaws and the absolute wreckage that they may have done to those they love as well as themselves. There's a reason why Kim Pine is most people's favorite character from the comic. The story of Scott Pilgrim is about learning to move past through trauma and become a better person. But boy, Scott is not punished nearly as much as he maybe should for dating that teenager and proceeding to cheat on her. Ramona, flaws and all, is still very much an unrealistically perfect girl for this guy. Scott has many women in the story who are into him despite him being a loser in every way. It's like the old Urusei Yatsura dilemma except, while Ataru is always punished for his skullduggery, Scott mostly gets what he wants. You're looking at them more than you're looking at me. <sighs> Look at those two. I mean, it's us 20 years ago. <laughs> you said you knew me. If you really knew me, why would you bring me here? Because I have no idea what I'm doing. Earlier I spoke about Boy Meets World and the potential toll that Cory and Topanga's story may have had on some couples who really tried and couldn't make it work. Cory's best friend Sean, who gave us both hair dysmorphia, suffers himself as he, who frankly had a lot more going on in this story than Cory, develops a long-term girlfriend who he goes through hell with as well. I, I don't know how to be myself around you. I, re I really want you to like me, Angela. I do like you. If I didn't, I wouldn't be here. So then why is this so hard? Then it's only at the very end of the show that... Let's not say goodbye. She leaves. Let's just say, I love you. I love you too. I actually kind of like that they did that. FBI, open up! <laughs> I actually kind of like that they did this to show that sometimes it just doesn't work, no matter how hard you try. That said, I'm not ignorant to the fact that there may have been a racial component here as Sean and Angela. Being an interracial couple on a family sitcom was an anomaly at this point, and there was some stuff going on behind the scenes. I may do a Boy Meets World retrospective at some point and unpack that stuff. these days has to practice a lot, doesn't he? A young man these days has to work very hard to be able to support a wife, doesn't he? Who said anything about a wife? The trouble with these romance stories and ethereal women is that they all too often project these normative views on how people should live their lives, perpetuating a certain form of love, one that just isn't for everyone. You're looking at them more than you're looking at me. Or sometimes just not in this form. You said you knew me. If you really knew me, why would you bring me here? Because I have no idea what I'm doing. Schroeder from Peanuts loves art. He loves his music. Personally, I can relate to this. The scenes where Lucy tries to flirt with him, especially when she reveals that her advances may have little to do with love at all. Do piano players make a lot of money, Schroeder? Some do. If they practice very hard, I guess. Keep practicing, kiddo. I relate to Schroeder's annoyance. Incidentally, who's this? George Washington? Not that he's being some kind of misogynist, but he really just wants to play piano. Some of us just want to play piano or paint or literally any other thing we care about, instead of getting tangled up in all this mess. That said, it is romance just as much as any other. 
dedicating your life to some skill or passion. And it also may have its what are some of your big regrets? problems. Big regrets? So I suppose that I, uh, that I fell in love with movies. You know, you can fall in love with a girl and have a ruin your life. And I fell in love with movies, and I have done less in my life than I would have if I hadn't. The final two examples I'll be giving here are literally why I decided to make Sessi. Good Night Pun Pun, or Oyasumi Pun Pun, is arguably the greatest manga series of all time. It is the ultimate response to feel good, coming of age romances like Boy Meets World. It is the most harrowing piece of fiction I've ever encountered, possibly. And I love it. Sachi appears to our protagonist, Onodera Pun Pun, at an interesting time in his life as well. They actually had encountered each other way before when Pun Pun was a kid, then when he was a teen and he went to an art show of hers, but they first properly meet when he's an adult of 18. Sachi appears to him after his mother dies. He's graduated from high school, moved out on his own, and now works part-time jobs. Pun Pun, I must note, is clinically depressed. His mother's recent passing has very little to do with it. Our boy's life has been, a uh, Rough, let's, let's put it that way. Uh, Pun Pun has one friend from school, but it's clear that he only really tolerates him. His landlord invites him to have a drink, and it is there that he meets Nanjo Sachi. Properly. She recognizes him from her art show, and remembers he wrote a story in her notes. It is a story about a boy who searches for a girl he once met, searching across the galaxy, perhaps in vain. She wants to make it into a picture book. Pun Pun gets blackout drunk and wakes up at her place. He sees her panties. He goes home and, uh, well, uh. A few days later, Sachi finds him again and he tells her what happened. <laughs> yeah! You see, when someone tells you this, the correct thing to do is. Once again, run! You run far! But Sachi says she's flattered and pretty much brushes it off. She's the one. It is then that Sachi and Pun Pun start to get really close as they work on this story together and just hang out. This is the only part of this entire manga that is anything close to being happy and blissful. But there is a looming horror that haunts Pun Pun. See, that story that Pun Pun wrote in Sachi's notes, it wasn't fiction, Pun Pun's no writer. Aiko is, if we're going by the narratives of a coming of age romance like Boy Meets World, for example, Aiko is Pun Pun's Tapanga. The story of Oyasumi Pun Pun opens with a 10 year old Pun Pun, a shy little boy who meets the new girl in his class, Tanaka Aiko. They were both social outcasts who came from families they hated. They're both a little bit screwed up in the head. They promise to be together forever. Pun Pun promises to run away with her to colonize a new star. Then name it Pun Punya. He promised to never lie to her. Aiko assures him that if he ever lied to her, she would kill him. Pun Pun broke promise after promise. He is devastated. She is cold towards him. Come high school, they separate. Until one day, after work, he sees her once again. Only briefly. He searches and searches the city, trying to find her. He promises himself that in two years, if he doesn't find her, he will. He told Sachi about Aiko, which is why after a full year of the two being all but a couple, Sachi wasn't at all shocked when he suddenly vanished. Pun Pun and Aiko's love story is definitionally peak romance, but boy is it stupid. 
Pun Pun, in the depths of despair over realizing he had never seen Aiko by his promised day of unaliving, holed up in his apartment. To him, it didn't matter that he now had a wonderful woman by his side who brought him a happiness that Aiko never did. He broke his promise. He neglected his duty. Then, by pure chance, they reunite. And what we then witness is the single most harrowing, depressing, bleak, painful arc in all of manga. The Eclipse has got nothing on this. I won't get into too much detail about Pun Pun and Aiko's runaway together, that honestly deserves its own hour long video, but Aiko is his poison, and he drinks it whole. Only bad, bad, terrible things happened on this trip, and it is the most romantic thing you've ever seen. Aiko wasn't real. Aiko is a concept that has existed in Pun Pun's head, which he has allowed to morph and boil and distort, as happens to most people we care about or hate. The more a person exists in your head, the less real they become. The same goes for how she views Pun Pun, I imagine. They both allowed each other to become concepts to fill some void they believe exists in their soul through some divine, cosmic fatalism of some kind. This leads to... Oh. However, the thing about Oizumi Pun Pun that actually rather took me out of it upon revisit is that Sachi... Oh, she's, she's just as unreal. Uh, my mate's playing a gig down there on Friday. I just thought it might be cool to swing by there and check it out. Your mate's playing a gig. Check it out. Mark, you're not trying to get away with pretending you're a normal human being, are you? She's the one. Dobby from Peep Show is an angel. Like Sachi, she appears to her protagonist when he's at his absolute lowest. Peep Show is the greatest cringe comedy British sitcom. It was created by Jesse Armstrong, who also made Succession. Peep Show follows two 30 somethings, Mark and Jeremy, or Jez, Jez, as they, like Pun Pun, go through the existential horror of life's mundanity. Where's the turkey, Jeremy? What? The turkey, where's the turkey? I thought you were getting the turkey. You what? No turkey! You fucking idiot, Jeremy! You total fucking idiot! That was your job, you fucking moron! You cretin! You're a fucking head! That's what you are! A fucking shithead! It was a joke, Mark. These two, as I see it, are both embodiments of the average Gen X British guy in the early 2000s. You have Mark, the suck up pencil pusher wage slave who always strives to be the ideal of what his society has deemed proper. Look, Jeremy, we've been through this before. I do the joint shopping solo because I don't make impulse purchases and I'm less swayed by the power Mark. of- And Jez, who is the exact opposite. An unsuccessful musician who freeloads off of Mark, regularly engaging in hedonistic acts rather than contributing anything to society. They're both jerks created by a system that fails people. England. England. Mark, for the first half of the show, has a love interest. His co-worker, Sophie played by Olivia Coleman, who he always seems to drive away in his attempts to impress her. I see you not around, but here. Okay, great. See you. Why does he even like Sophie? They have nothing in common at all. She's an easygoing party girl, he's a stuck-up nerd. In any case, he somehow manages to impress her. Somehow. Then, through shenanigans, they end up becoming engaged, just as Mark realizes that he may not actually like her that much. Mark, um, your alarm clock went off, so I went into your bag to turn it off, and I accidentally found something round and engagement-y. Oh, right. Shit! Oh God, I've not got it wrong, have I? You were going to... Oh, yeah, yeah, no. Well then, yes. Right then. No, I, I had to accept. It would have been too embarrassing not to accept the acceptance. What? So you're going to get married to her out of embarrassment? There are worse reasons. This is a central conflict with Mark. He always follows these social norms, checking the boxes, even if this is not something he truly wants. I don't think even Mark knows what he wants. It's always in his attempts to follow the rules that he makes a bollocks of himself. 
So, uh, heads, I marry, lifetime of potential grinding resentment. Tails, I stay here, become a social outcast, and turn my back on the woman I may very well love. After the engagement, Mark delays telling Sophie he doesn't like her anymore. As the days to the wedding march on. Ugh, it's marry. I'm gonna marry shit. Best of three. Eventually leading to the most hilarious and painful wedding episode of any sitcom you've ever seen. You really can't hold it in, then you'll just have to piss yourself. You're such a... Are you doing it already? Yes, I'm doing it already. I'm so pathetic that as soon as you ordered me to piss myself, I started the procedure. This is what you've done. You've ground down my sense of self-worth over the years. I hope you're proud. When are you going to stop? Not for a bit. Sophie and Mark separate on that very day. Don't say that, so It's done now. We're, we're over the hump. The hump! A wedding, the hump! Stop the car! Next episode, next season, everyone in the office hates Mark because of what he did to Sophie. I'm Debbie, but everyone calls me Dobby. Are you new? I'm... I don't think I've seen you here before, have I? I'm the IT misfit, the man with no name. It is then that this weird little woman wow, with a block of cheese decides cheese. to eat lunch with him. Is that allowed? I'm a smoker, I need man cheddar, you know? Dobby and Mark are both social outcasts in this setting, and maybe at this point they just need each other. At first I'm thinking, maybe hoping, that this just remains a platonic thing and they remain pals. That's when Dobby invites him to a closet to reach for something for her, and uh, this this happens. Oh, I can't reach. Could you? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, you'll, uh, you'll you'll have to move. Yeah, I should move, but I might not move. <laughs> Sure, you, you don't want to get out of the way. I'm alright. <laughs> this scene does way more than any exploitative thing that Sam Levinson has done in his career. Mark's troubles always come from when he tries to be someone he's not. Trying to be all, you know, British. Bloody Tuesday in it. But Dobby sees him as he is and says, I'm into that. You're not trying to get away with pretending you're a normal human being, are you? Darby represents the idea, the concept, of accepting yourself. And Mark still manages to mess it up. She's clearly created to be perfect for Mark, but he still manages to make it difficult for her in his attempts to be society's ideal. You know, fulfilling his duty. Cauliflower is not traditional, Dad. CAULIFLOWER IS TRADITIONAL! I don't know if it really is traditional. Do not slip a muzzle on your woman, please, Mark. You'll have to excuse me. Thank you. This has all been horrible. Throughout this whole show, in those episodes where he's apart from Dobby or Sophie, Mark is always seen searching for the one. Who is the one? What is the one? The one what, Mark? The one what? Will you two stop electrocuting each other? This utterly broke my spirit, but uh, spoilers for this sitcom, Dobby, who is a character literally created by a room of men to be the perfect match for this hopeless loser, manages to slip away from him. Oh my god, she's gone, where's she gone? Dobby? Dobby! Oh, whoa. Hey, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. Jez was also at fault, to be fair, but the way that these two broken people managed to ruin everything and sabotage both of their chances at happiness in life, I think there is a beautiful lesson in there for all of us. Your feelings for her are not real. They are real to me! Dobby, Sachi, Lum. Genie, Topanga, Aiko, all these women are fake. They are real to me! They were all crafted by teams of writers and artists to be ideal for a male protagonist, for a potential male audience to project themselves onto. I have built shrines for Nandro Sachi. I want to take her to the opera, or at least I did the first time I read that thing. 
The second time I was rather disappointed because the two-dimensionality really stuck out. Laisme Pun Pun is a manga deliberately written and drawn to be as immersive and realistic as possible, which is what makes those bleak parts feel so bleak. But there is no woman on earth as perfect as Nanjo Sachi. Even within the context of the story, she has had plastic surgery. That is, a mythical girl who was created explicitly to be a plot device to comment on the weakness of the male protagonist. All of these stories, some more nuanced than others, in the end are fiction. None of these girls is real. Women resembling them in some way or another may exist, but make no mistake, every character you see on the screen or on the page is a piece of artifice. The nature of storytelling necessitates that all characters support the protagonist. When so many protagonists are men, men that like women, the love interests written into the stories can only exist to support them in some way or another. And the thing is, it doesn't have to be this way. Mark soon learns that she never really loved Dobby either. There's Dobby. She doesn't like Passander and quality TV drama. She likes hitchhiking and terrifying actual drama. We don't fit. Oh my god, I'm letting go. I've crossed the bridge into adulthood. I'm moving on. I'm going to delete her off my GPS. This narrative that our stories perpetuate that men and women are always just fated to end up together is false. And not only is it false, it's dangerous. It lies, and quite often, for those who just don't know better, which in my experience is a lot of people, it hurts. Men who turn on women when their expectations are not met, men who turn on themselves, harassment, sometimes violence, all because of these artificial stories that we perpetuate. Not everyone is built the same way, not everyone likes the same people or lives the same life. Not everyone likes you. Maybe let's change the narrative a bit. Maybe we should have more narratives of people who get their fulfillment just from being themselves. Nothing wrong with having men and women just be friends. TLDR, leave me alone family, I don't have to get married if I don't want to.